Let us continue with what we learnt in proportional logic in the last lecture. First we shall review what we learnt in the last lecture. We saw what is meant by a proposition and taking proportional variables p and q, p q, we consider logical operators and or unary operator not and exclusive or operator implication and equivalence. To recall what we studied earlier, P and Q is true only when P is true and Q is true, P or Q is true when either P is true or Q is true or when both of them are true, it is false only when both P and Q are false. Considering not P, not P is true when P is false and not P is false when P is true. The exclusive or operator we consider like this. P exclusive or Q, this compound expression is true if one of P and Q is true and the other is false. It will be false when both of them are true or when both of them are false. P implies Q, we have seen how to express this in a different uh, ways. We can also say if P then Q, Q if P, P only if Q and so on. This is true if P is false or Q is true, that is in three cases it will be true, P false Q true, P false Q false, P true Q true. It is false only when P is true and Q is false. P is equivalent to Q, this is true if P and Q both take the same value. That is if P is false and Q is false, this will take the value 1. If P is true and Q is true also, this will take the value true. But if one of them is true and the other is false, this will take the value false or 0. We have also seen what is meant by a contra positive for P implies Q, the contra positive is not Q implies not P, this is called the contra positive. And Q implies P is called the converse of P implies we also saw how to draw two tables for propositional forms or well formed formulae of propositional logic. First we will have columns for each one of the variables and there will be a row corresponding to each assignment of values for the variables. Suppose there are three variables each can be true or false. So, there are totally 8 
equal to 2 power cube possible assignments and there will be 8 rules 8 rows in the table for any propositional form involving p q and r. In general if you have k variables there will be first k columns for each one of the variables and there will be 2 power k rows each one standing for one assignment of the truth values for the variables. We have also seen what is meant by a tautology. A tautology is a propositional form whose truth value is true for all possible values of its propositional variables example is p or not p contradiction or absurdity is a propositional form which is always false example is p and not p a propositional form which is neither a tautology nor a contradiction is called a contingency. Now in some cases it may not be necessary to have all the 2 power k rows for a truth table. For example, if you want to show that a propositional form is a contingency, it is enough if you show one row where the resultant expression takes the value 1 and another row where the resultant expression takes the value 0. This shows that for some assignment it will take the value 1 and for some other assignment it will take the value 0 and so it is a contingency. We need not have to uh, write all the 2 power k rows. And similarly in some cases you may have a simplified truth table. For example, I want to show that p and q implies p. This is a tautology. So, actually I should write 4 rows to show that this is a tautology and in the last column I should show that everything is 1, 1, 1, 1. But it is not necessary to write all the 4 rows because when will this implication be false? This implication will be false when this is true and this is false. So, when will this be true? When both P and Q are true. So, it is enough if I write only one row for this when will p and q be true when p is true and q is true. So, it is enough if we consider this row alone. So, in this case p and q is true and obviously p and q implies p because both the antecedent and the consequence are true this implication will be so, we find that it is not always necessary to write all the rows, some cases it is enough if you write a few rows which are necessary to show what we want. We have also seen some logical identities, let us recall what we have seen, this we have seen in the last lecture, so some of them are very clear. As I told you and is associative R is associative. So, you can write something like P and Q and R without any ambiguity. Similarly, P, R, Q, R, R also you can write without any ambiguity. But whenever you are in doubt you must use parenthesis so that the expression is unambiguous. But if you take P implies Q implies R, you cannot write like this, this is ambiguous. Do you mean P implies Q implies R or do you mean P implies Q implies R? Implication operator is not associative and we have to use proper parenthesis to represent what we mean. 
see the tables for these two expressions. P Q R P implies Q Q implies R P implies Q implies R P implies Q implies R. Let us draw the two table for this and see what happens. So, there will be 8 rows giving different values for P, Q and R. We know that 1 stands for truth and 0 stands for false. When is P implies Q true? In these cases it will be true and in these two cases it will be false. When will Q implies R be true? or when it will be false, when q is true and r is false, it will be false, in other cases it will be true. So, writing down the expression or the truth value in this column, you find that when q is true and r is false, this is false, but when q is false or when r is true, this will be true. Now, look at this column and this column, let us fill the truth value for these two columns. When can this be true? It will be true when P is false or Q implies R is true. It will be false when P is true and Q implies R is false. So, taking that you see that whenever P is false this will be true and what about Q implies R? Q implies R is false here and P is true. So, at this point you will take the value false. Here both the antecedent and the consequence are true in these three rows. So, this implication will be true. Now, let us go to the last column P implies Q implies R that will be false if this is true and this is false. It will be true if this is false R this is true. So, whenever R is true the compound expression will be true. So, looking at this here it will be true, it will be true here, it will be true here, it will be true here. If look at this P implies Q is true, but R is false. So, this will be false. Here P implies Q is true and R is also true, so that is 1. Here again P implies Q is true, but R is false, so this will be false. And here P implies Q is false, R is also false, so this will be true. And here P implies Q is true and R is false, so this will be false. So, you can see that the last two columns are not the same. So, it very much depends upon how you interpret this value that is whether you are going to put the parenthesis here or parenthesis here the meaning becomes entirely different. So, 
implication is not associative and you have to be careful when you write an expression of the form p implies q implies r you have to put parenthesis in a proper manner. We have seen some logical identities in the last lecture the idempotence of r and, and, and they are all tautologies then commutativity of r and commutativity of and associativity of r and de Morgan's laws distributive laws then laws involving one of the operands as true or false one stands for true and other false double negation not of not of p is p implication let us see what this means p in plus q is equivalent to not p or q let us construct the truth table for this and see what it is p q p in plus q not p not p r q so giving all four possible values for p and q Let us fill this column p in place q is false in this case and in the other three cases it is true we know this. Now what about not p not p is true when p is false and it is false when p is true. The last column is the ring of these two when is this ring of this false when both of them are false in this case both of them are false so it will be false in the other three cases at least one of them is true so this will be true now look at the third column and the fifth column you find that they are identical so p in plus q is equivalent to saying not p or so, we can use this equivalences for simplifying propositional forms or if you look at it as Boolean algebra Boolean expressions and replace one expression by an equivalent one. So, if you want to simplify something and if you have p in plus q you can replace it by not p or q and the next one is p is equivalent to q is equivalent to p in plus q and q in plus p for this also we can draw the truth table and see that they are equivalent similarly for every one of these things we can draw the truth table and see that they always whatever you have on the left side this is equivalent to this if you draw the two table the two columns will be identical similarly p and q implies r is equivalent to saying p implies q implies r this is called exportation we can draw the truth table for this also having 8 rows
if you draw the truth table some expressions or identities we are considering. The exportation rule says that P and Q implies R is equivalent to P implies Q implies R. Let us draw the truth table and see. You can see that the truth table for this is like this. There are 3 variables. So, there will be 8 rows having all the 8 possible values or 8 possible assignments. Then P and Q is true only when P is Q and Q is true. So, this is the value for P and Q and P and Q implies R this will be false only when this is true and R is false in this case. So, only in this case it will be false otherwise it will be true. Let us consider the value for Q implies R again it will be false when Q is true and R is false that is in these two rows alone it will be false rest of them it will be true and taking the last one P implies Q implies R that will be false only when P is true and Q implies R is true. So, comparing this and this you will realize that this is false only when this is true and this is false that is in this case. So, if you look at this column or this column you see that they are identical and that is what this logical identity says. P and Q implies R is equivalent to P implies Q implies R. Then we have a rule for absurdity that is P and Q and P implies Q and P implies not Q is equivalent to not P. This is the one which we will use for proving something by contradiction. This is called proof by contradiction and this is the law which we will use for proving such theorems. This we have to see contra positive P implies Q is equivalent to not Q implies not P. If you look at the table giving all the 4 possible assignments to P and Q you will get 4 rows when P is true Q will be false and so on this is the column for not P and this is the column for not Q this is the truth value for P implies Q this we already know for not Q implies not P that will be false only when not Q is true and not P is false that is in this case not Q is true and not P is false only in this case it will be false otherwise it will be true and so if you look at the last two columns you see that they are identical. So, whenever an expression involving implication P implies is true it is equivalent to saying not Q implies not P. Just for English uh, uh, sentence we consider if I fall into the lake I will get wet and if I am not wet means I have not fallen into the lake that is the contra positive of it. So, like this we consider these rules and these rules can be made use of to simplify logical expressions all well formed formulae of traditional logic. Let us take an example of an expression and see how to simplify it. Let us consider this expression we will make use of these identities which we considered earlier and simplify this expression. This is A implies B or A implies D implies B R T this is the expression. Here A B D are propositional variables. Now, let us see how to simplify this. First we shall change the implication into R. We know that A implies B is equal to saying not A or B 
and similarly A implies D is equivalent to saying not A or D. So, you can reduce this expression to this. Now, not A is common in both this. So, you can take it out and write it as not A or B or D Now, there is a implication involved here. So, again we can make use of the result that P implies Q is equivalent to not P or Q and write this as not of not A or B or D or Now, when you have a not out and if you want to bring it inside, we have to use what are called de Morgan's laws which we have already seen. These are called de Morgan's laws. So, this will become A and not B or D. this r becomes and when you bring the not inside and not of not of a will become a. Now, using the distributive law this will become a or b or d a or b or d and not B or D or B or D. Now, we know that if you have not P or P that reduces to 1, it is always true, it is a tautology. So, this will become A or B or D and 1 that is true and that is nothing but A or B or D. Now, because of the associative property of R you can write it as A or B or D without ambiguity. We can remove the parenthesis here it is not necessary because of the associative associativity of R. Like that using these identities we can simplify logical expressions. Let us consider some sentences in English and try to convert them into logical notation and also try to write down English sentences from the logical notation. Let us take an example. Now, let us consider this P stands for the sentence it is snowing and Q stands for I will go to town, R stands for I have time. Now, using logical connectives write a proposition which symbolizes the following. First, we have if it is not snowing and I have time then I will go to town. How can you write this in logical notation? If it is not snowing, it is snowing is P. So, it is not snowing means not P and I have time and R. If this is so, then I will go to town. This implies 
So, this sentence can be written logically in this form not P and R implies Q. The next one is I will go to town only if I have time. P implies Q can also be re read as P only if Q. So, I will go to town only if I have time in logical notation this will be Q implies the third sentence is a very simple sentence it is not snowing p stands for it is snowing so not p will stand for it is not snowing next you have it is snowing and i will not go to town what is the logical expression for this? It is snowing is P and I will not go to town that is not Q, Q is I will go to town. So, not Q is I will not go to town like that these English sentences can be written in logical notation and if you have a proposition how will you write it in English? how will you interpret properly and write it in English. Now, write a sentence in English corresponding to each of the following propositions Q is equivalent to R and not P, how can you write this in English? We know that this can be read as if and only if and what does Q stand for? Q stands for I will go to town. So, this can be written in the form I will go to town if and only if what is the condition on the other side R and not P what is R? R is I have time and P is it is snowing. So, if I have time and it is not snowing. So, this proposition Q is equivalent to R and not P if you want to write it in English it takes this form I will go to town if and only if I have time and it is not snowing. Now, how will you transcribe this proportion into English that is how will you write a sentence which is equivalent to this R and Q. R stands for I have time and Q stands for I will go to town. So, this can be written in the form I have time and I will go to town. The next one is Q implies R and R implies Q. How will you transcribe this in English? Q stands for I will go to town and R stands for I have time. So, Q implies R means this can be written in the form I will go to town only if I have time this can be written in the form I will go to town only if I have time then R in place Q you must write if I have time I will go to town if I have time I will go to town or equivalently Q implies R and R implies Q is equal to saying Q is equal to R. 
So, this can be also written in the form I will go to town if and only if I have time. The last is not R or Q, again R stands for I have time and Q stands for I will go to town. So, this can be written in the form it is not true that I have time or I will go to town. It is not true that I will have time or I will go to town. So, like this you can transform English sentences into logical notation and logical notation if you have you can write down the corresponding English sentences. You have to be careful when you use inclusive or or exclusive or usually either or would refer to exclusive or and otherwise it will be inclusive or, but you have to be careful about this. Let us consider some more logical identities. They are all tautologies involving implications and later on we shall see that they are also called rules of inference. So, these are the logical implications which are tautologies. Addition P implies P or Q. See when you have P by adding something the value is not altered. So, from P you can conclude P or Q if you look at it as a rule of inference from P you will be able to conclude P or Q. And simplification is the second rule. P and Q implies P. If you have P and Q, then from that you can conclude P because P and Q will be true only when P is true and Q is true, and so you can conclude P from that. So, if you look at it as a rule of inference, then you have this P and P implies Q implies Q. This is called modus ponens. Let us draw the two table and see how it looks. Considering the two table for modus ponens, we have four possible assignments for P and Q. So, we have four rows and we have written down the four possible values. P in plus Q, this is the truth value, this we also know. Now, P and Q, P and P implies Q, this will be true only when P is true and P implies is Q true is also true. So, you find that the truth value for this is in these three cases is take the value 0 and in this case it is 1. Now, the last column stands for the entire statement P implies P implies Q P and P implies Q implies Q. This will be true if the antecedent is false or the consequence is true. So, in these three rows the antecedent is false, so the compound statement will be true. In the last case when the antecedent is true the consequence is also true. So, this compound statement is again true. So, if you look at the last column you always have one it is a tautology. This is called a modus ponens and when you write it as a rule of inference you write like this P, P implies Q 
and from this you conclude Q. This is what is meant by modus ponens. Similarly, the next implication is modus tollens P and Q and not Q implies not P. We can draw the truth table for this also in a similar manner, but when we write it as a rule of inference <coughs> this means if you have P and Q, Q that is P implies Q and not Q from this you can conclude not P. This is called this rule therefore not P, this is called modus tollens. Whereas, this is called modus ponens. And we have some more rules not P and P R Q implies Q, this is called disjunctive syllogism, and P implies Q and Q implies R implies P implies R. This rule is called hypothetical syllogism. We will come across this again when we study rules of inference. This rule states that if you have P implies Q, implies Q implies R, implies P implies R and this is ending of two things and this is equivalence. P implies Q and R implies S implies P and R implies Q and S and this has this should be equivalence. P is equivalent to Q and Q is equivalent to R would imply P is equivalent to R. That last rule is if P is equivalent to Q and Q is equivalent to R, this would imply P is equivalent to R. We will make a use of this in logical inference when we come to that. Now, before that I will leave you with a problem and maybe the solution I shall give in the next lecture, but let us see what the problem is. A certain country is inhabited only by people who either always tell the truth or always tell lies that is either a person will be a truth teller or a liar and who will respond to questions only with a yes or a no answer. A tourist comes to a fork in the road. So, this is the situation you have a fork the tourist is approaching this place. A tourist comes to a fork in the road where one branch leads to the capital and the other does not. There is no sign indicating which branch to take, but there is an inhabitant Mr. Z standing at the fork. What single yes or no question should the tourist ask him to determine which branch to take? So, this tourist is approaching this fork, he sees a person sitting here, this person may be a truth teller or he may be a liar. A truth teller always tells the truth, a liar always lies and either the left road leads to the capital or right road leads to the capital. This tourist wants to find out, there is no board here. 
So, he ha he wants to ask this question, but this person z the inhabitant there may be a truth teller or may be a liar, this person does not know the tourist does not know whether he is a truth teller or a liar and he will respond only with yes or no answer, he will not say anything more. Now, in that situation this story should ask only one question, a single question for which the answer will be a yes or a no and by listening to that answer like this, if it is yes he will take the left road, the correct road, if it is no he will take the right road which is the correct road. Okay. So, what is the single yes or no question he should ask? So, you must look at the four possibilities, the person may be a truth teller and the left road may lead to cap capital, the person may be a liar and the left road may lead to capital, the person may be a truth teller and the right road may lead to capital, the person may be a liar and the right load may lead to capital. So, there are four possibilities and the single yes or no question should take care of all these things. Let us consider some more similar problems, five persons A, B, C, D, E are in a compartment in a train, A, C, E are men and B, D are women. The train passes through a tunnel and when it emerges it is found that E is murdered and an inquiry is held and A, B, C, D make the following statements. A says I am innocent, B was talking to E when the train was passing through the tunnel and B says I am innocent. I was not talking to E when the train was passing through the tunnel. C says I am innocent, D committed the murder. D says I am innocent, one of the men committed the murder. You must remember that A and C are men and B and D are women and each one is making two statements. 4 of these 8 statements are true and 4 are false, you have to assume that 4 of these 8 statements are true and 4 of them are false. Assuming only one person committed the murder, who did it? From these statements you must find out who committed the murder and each one is making 2 statements and therefore, there are 8 statements out of which 4 are true and 4 are false. Now, from these arguments or from these statements how will you found out, how will you find out who is, who has committed the murder. Look at the first 4 statement each, each one makes, A says I am innocent, B says I am innocent, C says I am innocent and D also says that. Now, only one person committed the murder. So, out of A, B, C, D, 3 of them must be saying the truth and one is lying. So, there are 8 statements, A is making statement 1 and statement 2, B is making statement 1 and statement 2, C is making statement 1, 2, D is making 1 and 2. Out of these, these all these 4 statements are I am innocent. So, out of which 3 of them are true, 1 is false. So, out of the 4, 3 are true, 1 is false. So, in the remaining 4, 3 of them must be false and 1 must be true because it is given that 4 of them are true and 4 of them are false. And look at the second statement of A and B, what is that? B was talking to E when the train was passing through the tunnel and B says I was not talking to E when the train was passing through the tunnel. One is the negation of the other, if what A says is true what B says is not true, if what B says is true A what A says is not true. 
So, out of these two one is false and the other is true either of them may be false the other may be true. So, it amounts to saying that this statement is false and this also is false. So, the second statement of C and D are false. What is the second statement of C? D committed the murder that is false. So, D did not commit the murder. What does C say? Second statement of D is one of the men committed the murder. So, that is also false that means A and C did not commit the murder. So, who committed the murder? B committed the murder. In that case, this first statement of A is true, this first statement of C is true, this is true, this is false, this is true, this is false, this is true, this is true, and these two are false, one of them is true and other is false. So, four statements are true true and four statements are false. So, this satisfies the condition and so we should come to the conclusion that B has committed the murder. We can look at similar problems like this as an extension of the example which I mentioned just a few minutes back. Let us consider one more problem this is much more difficult than that problem. A tourist is enjoying an afternoon refreshment in a local pub in England when the bartender says to him, do you see those three men over there? One is Mr. X who always tell the truth and another is Mr. Y who always lies and the third is Mr. Z who sometimes tells the truth and sometimes lies. That is. Mr. Z answers yes or no at random without regard to the question. You may ask them three yes or no questions always indicating which man should answer. If after asking three, three questions you correctly identify who is Mr. X, Mr. Y and Mr. Z, they will buy you a drink. What yes no questions should the thirsty tourist ask. The problem is like this. A person is sitting here, a tourist is sitting here, the waiter comes and he points out to three people standing out there. one, two, three, they are standing in a row and the waiter tells the tourist, look at those three people, one is Mr. X who is a truth teller, he always tells the truth, another is Mr. Y who is a liar who always says yes, uh, uh, who always lies, third person is Z, sometimes he lies and sometimes he tells the truth. Now, this tourist can ask these three people three questions. Each time he can ask the first question point out who should answer the question and then depending upon the answer he can ask the second question. So, second question again he can ask and point out who should answer the question again he can ask a similar third question. After getting the answer, all these three questions should be only yes or no question. The answer should be only in the form of yes or no. So, if it is correct, X will say, say the correct answer. Y, if it is yes, he will say no. If it is no, he will say yes. Z, without looking into that, he will randomly say yes, randomly say no. So, what three questions he should ask so that at the end he is able to find out the who is Mr. X, who is Mr. Y and who is Mr. Z. Actually, this is a not a very easy problem, it is slightly difficult, 
but the first question is important. The first question should be asked in a such a way that you eliminate z. Actually, it is easier to deal with the person who always tells the truth or who always lies. It is difficult to deal with the person like z who sometimes lies and sometimes tells the truth. So, here you have to find out who is z and eliminate him. And after eliminating z, the second and the third question can be conveniently asked. Think about the answer for this problem. I shall lead you to another problem, a similar problem. Brown, Jones and Smith are suspected of income tax evasion. They testify under oath as follows. Brown says, Jones is guilty and Smith is innocent. Jones says, if Brown is guilty, then so is Smith. Smith says, I am innocent, but at least one of the others is guilty. Assuming everybody told the truth, who is or who are all innocent, who are all guilty? Assuming the innocent told the truth and the guilty lied, who is guilty and who is innocent? Look at the statements they make. We have to transfer, transfer them into logical notation and solve, but the first portion is easy. Assuming everybody tells the truth, from the first statement you can infer that Jones is guilty and Smith is innocent and if Brown is guilty then so is Smith. So, the contrapositive of that will be if Smith is not guilty, Brown is not guilty, so Brown is innocent. So, the answer to the first portion is Brown is innocent, Jones is guilty and Smith is innocent. The second portion is slightly more involved, you can try the second portion also. So, in the next lecture we shall consider predicate calculus and use of quantifiers, existential quantifier and universal quantifier and further concepts in logic.